Ratna. Uh, so, Dr. Ramanna, welcome and thank you very much for your time you have provided us. And I think uh, all of our attendees, including uh, ourselves, our faculty members, would be greatly uh, benefited from your lecture. Uh, thank you once again for providing us your time. Sir, the floor is ours, uh, yours, and you can start your presentation right yeah. now. Great. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, please excuse me if there are some gaps because we are on the virtual platform right now presenting from here. I, I put my screen in full mode. I don't I don't think uh, you check check whether you are able to see it in full mode there. Uh, Is it in the full mode or it's in it's still not in the presentation mode? Uh, Jadip, what's the key of, uh, Jadip or Somnath, how you can, uh, how you can yes, see it, please, please response. Hi, I, I can view the presentation in the main screen. Yeah, is it in the full presentation mode or you are just seeing one slide over the no, small now small the presentation screen. mode has gone, uh, only I am, can view. Okay, your... now it is available. So, because uh, when I am putting in presentation mode, I see I, I don't see any other screen of the you now the platform. I only no, see my sir. Uh, please check. I am the presenter. Please uh, check. Uh, Hello. Sir, can you please uh, present one second? Present your screen. Uh, this is already my screen. I am sharing this uh, screen one... right now. No, once again, uh, stop. Uh, once again, you will stop and reconnect. Uh, yes, uh, the uh, participants are answering. Yes, they they can see you in full mode. Participants okay, are okay, 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 sir. Okay. Okay. okay, once again, you start your presentation so uh, they can see. Yeah, I can start now. Yeah, uh, but now we cannot see your presentation. Once again, you have to start your presentation. I think. I have to start my presentation again. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And go to full mode. Yeah, okay. Yeah, right. You can see it, right? Yes, we can see it fully. Full sir, mode, we can uh, see it. Sir, I, I would request you to see if there is one any uh, hand raised or any question coming. You please see and then update me. You can tell me because I will not be seeing those hand raising. No, no, that, 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 that's why I am here, sir. I, I will do that. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'm working in the area of basically the navigation sensors, okay? And uh, you are all uh, teachers, so let me start by saying Sri Guru Bhjohan Namha. All teachers, I give my namaskarams to all the teachers who are present over there listening to this one, because you are the ones who have taught us. So you may not have taught me directly, but the teachers are who have made me be in this particular stage. So I am. I started getting fascinated by nature. So I'll just uh, show one figure which I really was uh, really fascinated with this one because I just started presenting my presentations all with this particular uh, bird, which is called a baya weaver. It's a beautiful engineer in the nature. The the nest which it presents is really wonderful. Okay. Uh, now we'll come to this one. Actually, what is navigation and why? Why we require navigation, etc. As you all know, if you want to go from one place to other place, we need to know in which direction we have to go. That's why it is, uh, that is now basically a word from Latin or Greek. It has come where you have to move and then navigate yourself, I mean, find directions and then go to the destinations forward. So, but uh, we are from India and we are one of the early people who started navigating in this, navigating the seas. We say it as Navagati, I mean, uh, new position. Uh, the position uh, of the ships what we used to now uh, now is basically a ship so the gatis of the ship we call now gatis led to the word navigation that's what we put I, at least i put it in that okay now coming to even before the human started uh, talking about navigation nature has presented beautiful examples of uh, navigation you have sea turtles which travel thousands of kilometers across the seas and coming back to the same shore point to lay their eggs. And then birds which move from Siberia to India and then from South America to uh, Norway type of thing or uh, Arctic, uh, Arctic uh, site. 
huge number thousands of kilometers they travel each year and they still zero on to the same position it's a beautiful example of navigation how they could really come to the same place year after year year after year without missing so there is some something which they are able to sense and identify themselves or position themselves to say that yes this is the place which i come last year and then year after year they come and it is not just a one one time affair it is happening over the evolution and this is happening over there and this fascinated humans also and humans also started doing navigating initially they could not do anything they started finding landmarks on the earth and then started moving but over a period of time they could uh, understand the night skies and other things and then they could uh, direct themselves into the direction where identify okay this is the way we need to go using the night sky maps etc morning they used to see the sun and the expositions with respect to some landmarks etc and indians are one of the early farers of sea basically of course pollinations really ruled the sea starting from australia downwards towards uh, um arabia and other places but we are one of those early very early people who navigated the seas or oceans what we call now coming to why navigation sensors are required we all know that okay humans found some way of uh, uh, finding the way out etc by using some signals or some uh, vision I mean landmarks etc but for a system which is either flying in air or moving on a sea I mean Uh, moving in water on a sea on itself if it is to a position identify its position how it can do basically it doesn't have any landmarks or route maps etc over there so it needs some way out where human intervention is not there it need to find itself to make a way for itself or go along the path which is on the on the path in which it is intended to so that's why it needs some sensors which basically now what we use are called gyroscopes and accelerometers and of course we have what is called the global positioning uh, system or the satellites which are there used to find what is called gps gnss or glonass satellites are there which can give you the position your position very accurately without these sensors it becomes very difficult to identify the path along which the aircraft is moving or a missile is moving in air etc for these we need these sensors at least at least gyroscopes and accelerometers are a must for us to identify the position of that particular vehicle which is moving in space or air or in water now if you look uh, history of the navigation basically it started with landmarks then sun moon and stars the first instrument which has been identified is the magnetic compass and then the sextant then odometers then accelerometer gyroscopes which have come into picture i am not dwelling much into the history because this you can easily find whatever in fact i am speaking also will be mostly available in the net for you if you really scout for it you will be available so i will not dwell much into this one i'll just move into that one I mean the current state of the art sensors what we have are called the fiber optic gyroscopes ring, ring laser gyroscopes then hemispherical resonator gyroscope there may be some more things which may be there like mems gyroscopes etc i am not put because i am from a defense background so i'll just be covering most of those things which we use over here then the accelerometers we have uh, basically the pendulous mass uh, accelerometers based accelerometers force balance quartz accelerometers we have and then mems accelerometer also we have uh, i mean these are the state of the art uh, sensors which people are using across the globe now uh coming to the uh, fiber optic gyroscope uh, or the ring laser gyroscope i'll just say this uh, i'll just go back in history a little bit to explain you what is called a sanac uh, experiment here this is the basic uh, fundamental principle based on which the fiber optic gyroscope and the ring laser gyroscopes are uh, evolved basically basically in 1913 george sanac he is a french physicist he is uh, trying to do a experiment where he wants to find whether ether is present or not those are the times when michelson is doing his uh, experiments to find out ether's uh, presence of ether etc he they slight different he took a interferometer which is a closed loop interferometer in the sense that here uh, what will happen is uh, the, the beam uh, incident beam is made to split into two beams and then the two beams trace the same path but in opposite directions and again they combine in the uh, at the the other arm of the interferometer where the, you put a detector and then find the fringe pattern or observe the shift in the fringe pattern in the presence of rotation etc so he made a, a closed loop interferometer 
with an area of around 866 centimeters square and then uh, rotated the platform on which this interferometer has been put with around 72 degrees per second that is two revolutions per second type of thing and then he observed that a fringe is shifting by around 0 0.07 of a fringe width okay and in a sense uh, he has proved the presence of either as per his result uh, either is present but people at though in those time they said this is a relativistic effect not a presence of uh, either effect and then uh, people forgot the experiment at that particular point until 1960s when the laser has been formed i mean um, uh, basically the first lasers were made in 1960s till such time this was forgotten experiment the moment lasers have been found uh, they really use this principle to measure the rotation if you carefully see 720 degrees per second has created a shift fringe shift of around 0.97 of the fringe width so the, the at that time they found that the rate is changed uh, the fringe uh, shift also is changing so it's a measurement of rotation clearly but it is a huge system so people have forgotten that particular thing at that point and then they came back uh, to this experiment once the lasers were formed okay now just to see why there is a string shift taking place string shift takes place if we can create a path difference between the two beams let us see how the path difference comes into picture in this uh, uh, in this case uh, you see it uh, if there is no rotation taking place both the beams travel the same path there is a red color uh, circle in the middle is there uh, both the beams take the same path uh, and they reach the starting point or the point of observation in the same time. So there is no time difference between the two beams traveling across the path. Now. But in the presence of rotation, if here I am seeing that the rotation is taking place in the clockwise direction over here, then the beam which is traveling along the direction of rotations, it has to travel a little longer time to meet the point from where it has started and the beam which is moving in the opposite direction it will take a little lesser time to meet the point at from which it has started so this time difference you can uh, convert multiplying with velocity of c or so you can convert it to a path length difference uh, so it's a crude calculation of uh, bringing it out but it, it comes out like this simple so the path difference comes out to be 4 into a by c into omega omega is the rate of uh, rotation rate a is the area enclosed by this uh, interferometer or the path of the interferometer and then sees its uh, simple velocity of light now so we have a uh, simple uh, interferometer area enclosed if it is a then path difference in the presence of rotation delta l is given by 4a by c into omega now this is the example which has been come into picture and uh, uh, the fiber optic gyroscope exactly works on the same principle because if you have a very small area of let us say 860 square centimeter then the fringe shift is only 0 0.07 of a fringe uh, and the rotation rate is around 720 degree per second but if you want to measure lower rotations like one degree per second or less than one degree per second then that area is not sufficient so in order to um, increase the area what they have done is they have uh, put number of loops of fiber optic zero fiber optical fiber and then uh, created an area which is large much larger so that they can significant shift in the fringes is observed even for low rotation rates so people use uh, some fiber coil of 50 meters to 5 kilometers depending on their specification etc requirement to measure uh, different rates now people have made a uh, can measure up to almost like point uh, very 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 small rotation rates also they can measure and with the bias dips of around 0 0.0005 degree per hour also people have made but there are very few numbers which they could make using fibers then coming to ring lasers the first uh, ring laser gyro was made way back in 1963 when Mathek and Davis in Sperry gyroscope company, they have developed a ring laser of one meter uh, a side size, square uh, square resonator they have made with the four square four meter perimeter using 1.15 micron as a wavelength of, of the laser. Uh, after this, they found that there are um, basically it looks like this: uh, you have four reflecting components, mirrors or prisms you can use, and they have a gain media. And then uh, you bring out the two beams and make them overlap and create an interferometer. In a ring laser, what will happen is uh, because it is a laser oscillator, the path difference uh, between the two beams gets converted into the frequency difference of the two beams. So even the slightest variation in the path can create a considerable amount of frequency shift in the 
uh, both the beams, which we can measure by just beating them outside once we they get out of the in the parameter or the ring resonator. The output we can measure. So, and if we try to look at the bead frequency between the two beams, how they are related, it can be related like this, and then. Uh, the bead frequency is given by 4a by lambda l into the omega where omega is the rotation rate input rotation rate and then uh, this 4a by lambda l is called the scale factor of that particular ring laser gyro or the resonator the ring resonator now a is the area enclosed uh, by the path traveled by the two beams and l is the total length of the cavity uh, which in this in the, in the first case if i say it is around four four meter perimeter and lambda is the wavelength with which it gets operated Nowadays, uh, world over, people are using only 632.8 nanometer uh, as the wavelength. They are not using 1.15 uh, as has been uh, used by Masek and Davis, but they are using 632.8 nanometer wavelength. And here, if you carefully see if a path difference of around 10 to the power of minus 15 meter is created, a frequency difference of 4 hertz is coming out from the ring laser arrow of around 30 centimeter. Uh, I mean, peri I mean, if the perimeter is 30 centimeter, uh, then uh, it gives around 400 hertz uh, variation. It's a beautiful uh, sensing element now because even a uh, tenth power of minus 15 meter can be measured comfortably using a ring laser. Okay. Uh, so this is the now major sensing element as a gyroscope across the globe now. All the aircrafts, whatever fly, flying in the commercial aircrafts or so, whatever are flying airplanes which are flying. They inevitably contain these ring laser gyroscope as one of their uh, uh, navigation sensors. Now, but it has a problem. Any sensor is not really ideal in the sense it will not work perfectly. It has some problem because they are all made by us. So there will be some imperfection always. And ring laser is basically an oscillator like any other electronic oscillator or a mechanical oscillator. You say laser is an optical oscillator in the sense that it can, if two laser beams are traveling, are moving in the same cavity, and then they can get coupled in energies. And then they, when they get coupled, they end up having a similar problem of lock-in, like mechanical oscillators of, or two coupled electronic oscillators have a coupling problem and lock-in problem. This also will have a lock-in effect. Uh, it comes like this. <coughs> Both these beams get energy coupled wherever they are interfacing with some reflecting element also. So mm, the coupling, because of that one, what will happen is if the input rotation rate is less than a particular threshold value, which we call the lock-in threshold, both the beams, so there is a rotation and there is a path difference between the two beams, they get locked on to one single frequency and thereby making the beat equal to zero. So that means even though rotation is there, the beat signal becomes zero. This became a problem for these uh, particular ring laser gyros, but it is useful to measure low rotations, but the low rotations, it can get locked on to single frequency, giving no output. But this problem was overcome by a number of ways, but uh, the major way or the major method which people use is a mechanical deter you know, uh, to overcome this lock-in problem. But there are a number of ways which they have overcome. They used a mechanical deter, a magnetic mirror, then an oscillating mirrors. Then you used uh, like Gmon effect, Faraday effects, the reciprocal or non-reciprocal effects putting together. And then out of plane cavities, normally ring laser cavities in a single plane, but you can take one of the mirrors slightly in slightly out of plane and then bring in some polarization changes which can take away the what this lock-in effects, etc. all those things. But the most successful method so far is uh, the mechanical deter. Many of the producers across the globe use this mechanical deter, except for one person, uh, one company which uses this Faraday effect to come Gmon effect to overcome the problem. Now, uh, what happens when you have a mechanical deter is apart from this is all for, uh, in a sense rotation. Dithering is like a simple uh, pendulum or a simple harmonic motion taking place. It's also like a rotation only. Only thing is this rotation changes continuously from the extreme position of the oscillation where the rotation rate is zero to the rate is maximum at its mean point and again goes to zero at the extreme point. So it's a rotation rate which is changing its value and direction at a regular interval of time. So this gets added up into your interference pattern as a m sin omega dt has been put in the interference expression over here. And then, but still we end up getting to some locking zones wherever this uh, reversal of direction is taking place in the rotation. 
but that is uh, absolutely for few microseconds which can be neglected or overcome by using some modeling gadgets right? so now um, people find found a way out of overcoming this problem using some other technique and it still works out very well Uh, apart from the uses in uh, navigation, there are other uses of ring laser gyroscopes also. These are the um, the biggest or the largest ring laser gyroscopes which ever been made by humans. This is in uh, New Zealand. There is a program called uh, Canterbury Ring Laser Gyro Project. Uh, there is a in a uh, underground uh, cavern, World War II uh, it's a safe place they have bunker they have made a ring laser with a size of around 21 meter by 39.7 meter which is called a ug2 laser over there in 2004 that is the largest laser and then what they do here is basically they use these lasers to identify or the measure the uh, wobbling of the earth's rotation axis to that extent they are measuring these things they could clearly see that earth's axis is not stable when while it is spinning uh, about its own self i mean so that wobbling of that axis also they could find using this large laser same uh, some other physical constants also they are trying to measure the diurnal motion of uh, moons and other things all those effects they are trying to measure using these big large spring lasers mm -hmm. Now, coming to the other uh, gyroscopes which are now um, present uh, in most of the satellites outside india or um, major major satellites which are there they all go with all the long space uh, journeys made by us like all the out of uh, solar system things also they contain these uh, hemispherical resonator gyroscopes because they are once made uh, they run for a longer period it's a very simple principle on which it has been uh, formed i'll just uh, play a small video over here uh, you just listen this is a one minute video uh, it will be very beautiful. You can just uh, listen to this one. Brian has discovered a simple yet fascinating physical principle, one that eventually leads to the development of an instrument for sensing rotation, a gyro. But we'll let him explain his discovery himself. When I set the glass and vibrate, <clears throat> I say, when I strike the glass, the glass vibrates like this. Of course, the motion is exaggerated and slowed here. You see, there are four points around the rim of the glass that are moving the most. These are called antinodes. Now, we will put a point of reference on the rim of the glass and set the rim in motion again. Now, we will rotate the glass around its step. And you will see what I have discovered. You see, when the glass rotates, the vibration pattern also rotates, but not as much as the glass does. It lags behind. Let me show you again, but with less exaggerated motion. Remarkable. And the degree of this lag is always the same. Always the same exact. Brian has discovered a remarkably simple and extremely accurate way of sensing and measuring rotation. So this is a very simple, hope you have heard the video. Uh, this is a very simple uh, principle of uh, measuring the rotation. When you put this uh, glass uh, rim uh, on vibration, what we will see is these uh, anti nodes will not move along with the actual uh, rotation in the rim of the uh, glass. Okay, there's a lag, and this lag is function of the rotation rate, so it can be easily measured using this one. And since this is made of few silica and it's very flexible in the sense its uh, thickness is around 0.5 mm only, they will not make much larger thickness. So it can sustain for a longer period and there is no other element, only one element. You measure this change in the antinode with respect to its reference axis by using capacitive picking up, pickoffs, and then identify that one and then you can one can easily really make the system, but it's a very complicated system to make actually. But these are being made by very, maybe two companies across the globe or three companies across the globe. But this is one wonderful uh, sensor which is now prevalent in most of the, <coughs> at least, Western satellites.
and people could achieve the bias dips of the order of 0.305 degree per hour plus of gyro over here which is more or less the 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 best ring laser gyro used in navigation also gives over there <clears throat> but it has so its own it has its own uh, problems that it will not have a larger range to measure etc like a ring laser gyro has so that's why where the range requirement is very less there these uh, hemispherical resonator gyros are used where the range requirement and the bias drift requirements are higher than their uh, ring laser gyros are used and where for a short term applications fiber optic gyros will be used because of the bias drift values or the stabilities of the scale factor stabilities etc which come into picture now once we have all these gyros still we are making new gyros because of some other commercial requirements have come lens based sensors have emerged into picture with new technologies coming lens based sensors also have come into picture i not well much into this thing but i'll show it's how very small and most of all our uh, so called uh, smartphones which we are using remedies contain these uh, lens based gyroscopes and accelerometers most of every one of you can just check with your in your mobile uh, you will always see uh, what is called your accelerometer and then gyroscopes present in your mobile so the smartphones now these are not regularly used or many of the missions of uh, the defense or major where our strategic systems are required but now it is things are improving even in these things people are trying to overcome the problems which mems based sensors are also going to face uh, are facing or right now which are being faced by these sensors people are trying to overcome by finding some way or the other out how to overcome these problems so mems mems zeros are slowly picking up and uh, uh, they will come to maybe strategic market maybe down the line 5 to 10 years from now now coming to the quad accelerometer what we have over here is it's a pendulous mass accelerometer only uh, pendulous mass accelerometer what we have here is uh, this is called force balance uh, quad accelerometer you have a pendulous mass which is very small over here in the center unfortunately i have not put my pointer over here but okay uh, this pendulous mass uh, is uh, when it is accelerating the system gets accelerated this pendulous mass moves in the uh, other direction so now this deflection is what is picked off by using a capacitor uh, capacitance uh, pick off and then you can measure the deflection and then really identify what is the mass but the problem is if the acceleration is too much what will happen is this pendulum can the at its uh, contact point it can break and then it creates a problem so what people do is they use some thing called a force uh, torquer coils to force the pendulum to remain always at the mean position now based on the the, the movement it is uh, moving away from the mean position capacitance changes capacitance pick off signal I mean capacitance pick off points will pick a signal and then they try to give a reverse force to it using the magnetic torquer coils to keep it in the mean position and the force required to keep it in the mean position is exactly equal to the acceleration what it is sensing basically so from that we can easily find out what is the acceleration of the platform on which this particular accelerometer is kept now people have achieved bias stabilities of the order of uh, less than 5 micro g or so but so far uh, that's the best thing which people could get could get so far okay now but still we didn't stop at that particular point of time okay we did not really stop at that particular point of time people start exploring new sensors further but what is the need for new sensors over here why we need to look into new sensors see there are issues even with these sensors okay uh, let us say a 0.015 degree per our class of gyro can result in an error of a position an error of around 1 nautical mile okay <laughs> over a period of an hour uh, to correct this error right now what people use is they connect to use gps or gnss or glonass or even our own indian uh, satellite systems irnss systems also they can use these satellites to correct the error in the positions gps and glonass can uh, the gps the updates can reduce the error to as low as 20 cm but 
when you have gps then why do you require any other sensor the the issue comes because there are problems with gps and gnss all these type of global positioning systems also why it will not work under water or underground it will not work where um, any other full covering is there so and it is easy to jam the gps signals also okay and during war time let us say is gps really available to the people it may not be available to the or it may give incorrect data during war time so when it is really required so there is a problem for this one so where gps is not there one has to go for a dead recon or a pure inertial sensors without uh, i mean having a very good uh, bias stability sort of very very low bias drift values etc so this is something which made really people to look into new technologies or new ideas where we can use this to find out accelerometers or gyroscopes where we can have really really very very low drift values now what are the other things which are forcing us to look into now everywhere people want to reduce the sizes weights cost everything comes into picture so this is another thing which is forcing people to reduce the sizes or cost of it etc and this is forcing people to look for miniaturization of the existing platforms or the sensors and or look for new sensors which are already having a low size cost and weight etc this is something which is forcing people to really look into new directions and new ways of making these sensors the same sensor or a new sensor now ultimately we look at current day positions we are uh, looking for high pressure sensors and at the same time we are looking for miniaturized sensors also so one way is to miniaturize the existing state of the art sensors can it be done question comes into picture yes some of these sensors can be miniaturized let us see what sort of things we can over, uh, think of here and then do do really talk about those things so if we carefully see fogs and rlgs can pave um, way to the micro or nano photonic gyros where you work with uh, micro ring resonators or a nano ring resonators or even uh, micro ring laser gyros <clears throat> whether it is possible or not let's see then hrg will move into miniaturized size or even to micro hrgs then mems based sensor are improving over a period of time they still are coming up and then maybe a few new sensors uh, one of the sensors which people are talking about is biomimicking sensors because all these birds turtles how they are mapping themselves to come back to the same point year after year so there is and they have very small size if you carefully look their sensing elements are also smaller in size their total volume is also small in size so can we really mimic those um, living beings sensors used by those living beings and produce sensors of really small size and accuracy i mean so people are looking at different ways of doing those things so we are at to start in our place uh, anything on the biomimicking sensors but world over people are putting efforts to make those things <clears throat> this is a paper uh, published in nature photonics in 2018 where they have uh, come out with a nano photonic uh, optical gyroscope uh, where they use the reciprocal sensitivity they have made this and then try to measure this one this is a <clears throat> beautiful uh, paper which has come out and then they are able to measure the rotation over here it is still on a research bed it's not in the commercial mode yet so it will take some more time because uh, once a principle is proved to make bring it into device many other aspects also need to be addressed from packaging to uh, interference with other uh, electromagnetic interference or compatibilities so many other things uh, uh, it's uh, it's working conditions under different environments basically in different temperatures different vibration conditions shock conditions and even radiation conditions sometimes maybe suppose you have to put this in a say, spacecraft then it should withstand radiation effects also so uh, from the proof of concept to the coming to a stage where it is converted really uh, converted into a device productionable device then many steps it has to go through hopefully this will see its uh, uh, day maybe in few years from now <clears throat> so this is what they have made they have used uh, a single laser which is coming from outside which is split into two and then they have made two resonators over here 
uh, use some non reciprocal or reciprocal effects to identify the measure the rotation and it's a very wonderful uh, principle etc i am not going into the mathematics of it because it will that itself will take long time these are just introducing to the technologies which are being used for sensors at this point of time uh in india we i i, I really could not scan the total academic area um, who are working on micro rings etc but uh, some time back i have seen few people are working on micro ring resonators but hopefully some of them will pick up some idea like this and come out with a really beautiful uh, sensing rotation sensing element within india we hope to see maybe in the next 5 to 6 years somebody may be coming up with some idea like this and now uh, the us they have started a program where they they took the principle of this uh, hrg and then try to make sensors similar to hrg at a micro level okay this is a really wonderful idea of making bringing this uh, hrg taking into a million micro levels miniaturized size a similar structures they are making and then trying to measure rotations these are all 3d mems which they used and the latest technologies uh, which have been developed in the mems area they are enabling these type of developments uh, uh, for converting the hrg principle into a very small dimensions using it in a very small dimension this is another uh, very beautiful idea which has uh, come out in the maybe this also is a not very new one it's also a little old i mean four or five years back story only but this is coming out very beautifully converting the larger things into miniaturized sizes now ring lasers also are not uh, lagging behind now someone uh, there's a paper recently in june 2020 only in this nature photonics again where they used uh, normal laser using fibers they coupled it to a silicon micro ring resonator where they found brillouin uh, scattering brillouin brillouin laser they have made stimulated brillouin laser which can uh, two lasers which can propagate in opposite directions uh, in, in the same micro ring resonator and then they did measure the hertz rate using this one this is a wonderful piece of work which has come recently and uh, this is something really we, i at least uh, because we have never thought because we have never see okay people have seen this brillouin laser in uh, fibers but they have not looked in at this micro level of micro ring resonators but this is a very beautiful uh, progress as far as uh, for the ring lasers at chip level chip level these are something which really could uh, maybe transform the total ring laser gyro uh, scope uh, technologies only Uh, they made a 36 mm uh, ring over here and then uh, try to measure the earth's rotation this is um, the entire thing reduces okay you need to have a diode laser I mean diode laser coupled to a fiber which will create this stimulate stimulate these uh, lasers brillouin lasers in this micro ring okay but still we don't really have much of a advantage is that this is on a silicon so you can put electronics also onto the same chip and then complete the total thing so it miniaturizes the existing rlds to a drastically this is what is this may be a game changer on the long run in the next 5 6 years i hope that this uh, will see very beautiful I mean very good progress in the next 5 years i expect this to be dominating the field in the coming years but still but still it has its own limitation it may not go beyond certain uh, bias drift values less than certain many very low low bias drifts which are required for underwater applications so what people have found I mean still <coughs> mems based gyros are also coming but it will take a little time multi layer mems are coming 3d mems are coming then um, mems along with the optics moems which are called moems nowadays that also are coming to come out with new sensing element like uh, moem based accelerometers are also being developed uh, in the way at different places in the world okay so these are something i am just throwing you ideas because you are all teachers and most of you may be guiding some students also see you keep coming across new principles new phenomena what i request you all is to keep your eyes wide open any simple principle which can affect which gets affected uh, or uh, any parameter which get affects because of rotation or acceleration keep a look at them and if you can convert that into a device initially okay it may be possible to production uh, get to a production level or not but thought process will start and new principles and new sensing mechanisms can be identified and at least some of them may really reach the stage where it can be used in 
some production place some uh, uh, some place and those things will be coming from india we are a place particularly i am really odd with uh, calcutta because uh, uh, that's the place where lots of things have been developed uh, and i hope that still will continue on the next uh, coming generations also will keep doing it so i expect something really big to coming from that particular place west bengal area because it's a very good place for uh, education and then physics is uh, really wonderful in that particular place so you people really can bring out come out with some new ideas and then with the make in india concept of the government maybe you can really do good things in the coming years over there uh, try to catch on the ideas and then work on the ideas i don't say that every idea what we get can see the light at the end of the journey some of them may not but it doesn't matter but it is a idea which we try that's all some of the ideas will certainly come out well and those ideas will give us the required uh, what you call stature or the name we don't work for the name but it gives the satisfaction and the pleasure yes yes we have made something for this country that's what uh, i i want to say you people okay and then these are the mems based sensors many things which are developing not just uh, everything going on system on chip type of things came, coming everything they are trying to put in a single chip many sensors clubbing into a single chip etc making it more rugged and other things okay and now people didn't stop there they are looking at principles which can be still brought in and then converted into a sensing sensor one such thing is a cold atom interferometer gyroscope and accelerometer this started way back when laser cooling was uh, discovered or uh, experiment the first experiments of laser cooling were done people started thinking of a laser cold atom cold atom interferometer at that particular point of time and then they have come out with an interferometer which can measure rotation as well as acceleration it's a beautiful concept it again runs on the same uh, principle of the sanyak uh, experiment uh, which is called the sanyak effect uh it, it runs on the same principle but let us see uh, how laser cooling is done is basically it uses the mechanical effect when a laser uh, is uh, made to fall on an atom which is moving there will be slight change uh, the, okay it, it, if it is in resonance with the one of the energy levels the laser photon is absorbed and then again released back while it is resisting uh, spontaneously emitted photon can go in any of the four pi stadian direction so once it goes in some other direction then it can create a recoil in the atom thereby changing its momentum a slight but since the density of photons in a laser beam will be very high this momentum change will become huge in just no time and then the atoms velocity reduces in um, almost close to zero and direction also can be reversed if the still laser persists over there <clears throat> this is the cooling effect of the basically laser cooling principle okay and then you can create a beam of uh, cold atoms then create a beam splitter of the cold atoms then reflection or mirrors for the cold atom beams and then again beam combiners for the cold atom what are these things which you carefully see again we use pair of uh, lasers uh, we create a <clears throat> bunch of uh, cold atoms in what is called a magneto optical trap where we, uh, magnetic trap is something where we use a anti helmholtz coil and these atoms which are neutral atoms they get trapped if we create the, this because of the magnetic gradient they move towards the magnetic null position and get trapped over there but since the velocities are high at that point of time they can still move away but we people use six laser beams along the three coordinate axis opposite to each other and then cool this uh, reduce the velocity of these atoms almost close to zero values you can never make it zero but you can bring it to close to zero values and hence they get trapped that's why it is called a magneto optical trap and then once they get trapped over there you use a laser beam to push these atoms in one direction another laser beam to push these atoms in one direction so you have a cloud of atoms which are moving in one direction once this cold atom cloud is moving in one direction you all of them are atoms in a particular state you can put them in a one particular state then use a pair of lasers which are called uh, raman pair of lasers 
since uh, you, in the raman if you use one at one particular frequency it gets to higher energy state and then other thing is used to stimulate I mean do the stimulation of uh, stimulated photon generation of that to the ground state again which is a raman transition again so use this to split the atoms I mean into two clouds and then again use another uh, which is called a pi by 2 uh, uh, raman basically here and then uh, interaction pi by 2 interaction which is called so that the two this uh, single cloud splits into two <coughs> 15 hours. 50 percent of the atoms moves into a second state, and then 50 percent are in the original state because there is a state change, there is a change in momentum, and then the direction changes. So it's split into two beams, and then you use another pair of Raman lasers. Now it is called a pi interaction. It's a where entire bunch of one bunch is uh, state is changed. The other bunch it changes its state. So now because the change in the state the directions are changed and they are made to come towards a single point meet at a point where again another pair of lasers split each of these clouds into two clouds <clears throat> thereby one one part of the one cloud and the other part 50 percent of the second cloud combine together uh, to create interference pattern so we can see two different interference pattern over here you measure the interference pattern and the shift in the interference pattern to measure rotation and even acceleration see the <clears throat> how we use is uh, we use the matter wave uh, configuration of these cold atoms not as the particles but we use the matter wave configura uh, configuration over here to create this interference pattern and if you barely look at the mathematics just uh, the phase difference created by the atom interferometer to the top the light interferometer having equal area equal area uh, the uh, difference comes to be around the order of 10 power 11 over here. It's a huge advantage, but uh, there are other issues which are coming into picture. It's still not in the product stage. It is still in the research stage only, but it has a massive advantage. Certainly, can, whether we can really utilize this massive advantage, we have to wait and see. Some time is required uh, to really see whether it is really giving that advantage over there or not. But yes, in certain areas we have seen that uh, uh, when uh, people are making gravimeters using this particular technique and it is really giving up the order of 10 power minus 8 to minus 10 G. That means uh, that much of variation you can measure. It's a wonderful uh, thing which has emerged over here. <coughs> so uh, the this same interferometer can measure acceleration also. So suppose if you have an acceleration taking place in this uh, direction over here, then what will happen is the wavelength of the matter waves changes and that change also will affect in the phase shift. Uh, in the phase difference will come in that because of this also. So in order to measure both rotation and acceleration using the same interferometer, it is not possible because the output single interferometer will not help us in giving out the output of both uh, rotation as well as acceleration so what people do uh, people have done is they have put two interferometers in the same plane but in opposite directions in opposite direction so one of the interferometers will see a effect of uh, a rotation plus acceleration the other one can see acceleration minus rotation so when you combine you can measure uh, when you add those two phases so because of the phase differences of the two interferometers if you add then you will get uh, acceleration output and you take the difference you will get the rotation output. this is a very beautiful way of uh, bring, uh, using this is how people try to overcome the problems which they face when they are really developing these sensing elements or sensors over here <clears throat> this is the diagram which i have picked up from um, institute of quantum optics germany And the first uh, gyroscopic measurement done in this cold atom interferometer was done by Kasevich uh, basically way back. And then his own students, Gustafsson and uh, others also have uh, started doing all these things. And then they have made a small portable type of thing, which is like a two feet by two feet by two feet, almost cube of the order of around 200 kg system, which they tried to make and then see. From this stage to this stage, they could come over here, but still it still has to come down in its size. Okay, uh, these are the gravimeters which have been made in Stanford. Uh, uh, this is the gyroscope which is made in Hanover. This is a gradiometer. Uh, this is a gravity gradiometer basically in Florence. Most of the accuracies what people have found is of the order of 4 to the 4 in 10 power minus 9 uh, times G, absolute accuracies. And then 
something better than this if it is in space it can go beyond this I mean much less than this one it can it is expected to give 10 power minus 10 11 g also over there <clears throat> people tested under different conditions yeah people already have achieved of the order of 10 power minus 10 g stabilities by stabilities it's a very good the, uh, the things which we are talking about is around 10 to the power of minus 6 now now they've gone almost four orders down but this is large in size still it's not still in smaller size so it really cannot be used in number of places in france they have come out with a three axis gyroscope and two axis accelerometers but the sensing element size is around 30 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 50 centimeter that itself is in heart large apart from this you need to have the electronics the lasers the optics and other things are present so put together the system will be really 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 bulky so people started thinking in what else we can make this reduced so people started making what is called cold atom clouds on chips then what is a bose einstein condensate on a chip and now they're trying to make an interferometer on a chip whatever interferometer we are talking about on a chip with the uh, BECs. Now BEC has its own uh, problems because it is very sensitive. Your uh, conditions have to be extremely stable to really hold the BEC for a longer period. Hmm. Bose Einstein condensate cloud. So people are still trying to work out uh, just by using, instead of BEC, can we use a cold atom itself on the chip and then try to create an interferometer on chip and still measure acceleration and rotations. This still we need to look for some more years to really see whether that is coming happening or not. But this is one of the gyros for the future, which is going to give a better rotation sensitivity, etc. And acceleration sensitivities measurement wise. Now all gravity measurements, absolute gravity can be used, measured. Absolute gravity can be measured over here. And then uh, it can be used for uh, many applications, like when you want to construct a huge um, structure, etc. You can map the area for identifying sinkholes because the gravity variation will be there when sinkhole is there. Or even after constructing a huge constru uh, structure, you can keep monitoring the gravity in and around to identify whether any sinkhole is being developed or uh, something else is happening underground to identify whether any damage can occur to the structure. We can identify the various uh, materials and then uh, even uh, maybe people are thinking of using these gravimeters to identify smuggling of nuclear materials, etc. All those things are possible. Underground uh, structures can be identified because if a regular structure is present inside the underground, you can see the difference in the gravity because of the structure and they can identify underground structures also. So many such things are possible once we can miniaturize the sizes and it can be made to brought to use over there. These are some of the things which people thought it can be made like this, etc. <clears throat> Still working on many chips, people are working different ideas. Currently, just to put in a nutshell, initially it is like this size. Right now, all those things, if you carefully see, at least the size has been brought down to considerably, considerably, but still not in a position to be used in many places this size the reducer size can be used in some places where you have the uh, luxury of space and weight there we can still use but where we don't have the luxury of space and weight we still cannot use these systems at this point of time so these are the values which people have demonstrated 10 power minus 6 degrees per root hour or i mean degrees per hour of bias stabilities which is very high, I mean, I mean very high bias stability in the current uh, uh, expected uh, situations. And the bias stabilities of accelerometers of the order of 10 power minus 10 g have already been shown, people, shown here. In space, this order just increases like anything. Two, three orders better it can be done. We look at the inertial sensors technology map, uh, short term and long terms. If we carefully look at these things, uh, mm, oh, yeah, here, what is blue in color is the uh, atom interferometer based uh, gyroscope and uh, accelerometer and uh, gyroscopes. 
the pressure floated mechanical resonators are occupying the major space even in the otherwise also in the gyros and the acceleration accelerometers but here what is happening is your rlds and fogs are coming to 0 0.3015 degree per hour of bias stabilities in gyroscopes whereas yeah i can go one order less uh, or two orders less over there uh, but mechanical gyros are also there but uh, compared to mechanical gyros yeah he has a better scale factor stability so they may be going to come into picture and dominate for some time in the coming years still not in market so it will take some time to come but they may be dominating the scene on the longer run if we carefully see um, but if you look at the long term inertial I mean accelerometer projections atom inframeter based uh, accelerometer is going to be the one which we'll be looking at then the mechanical and then the mems or integrated optic uh, accelerometers which are going to come into picture <coughs> coming to gyroscopes now all other gyros are going to fade away only they are projecting only that mems integrated optics i integrated fog and then atom inframeter only they are projecting rest of the things may be not be visible or they may be there but uh, most things which may dominate on the long run are these based these are the things which are going to dominate so i just uh, whatever is the map whatever is been given here uh, because their numbers are not clearly visible i just try to put the the two maps over here the long term and the short term projections into a table over here and then have put over here i i fog can have a bias stability up to this rlgs hrgs these are the near time predictions and these are the far time predictions or long term predictions where mems 3d mems io optic zeros etc will be dominating this particular 0 0.012 2000 degree per hour and then i fog will dominate uh 0 0.00152.005 0 .00 degree per hour and then less than that is cold atom inframeter will be dominating then mems accelerometer mechanical precision then the cold atom inframeter these are the things i have put a so it can go less than 0.01 uh, uh, micro g stabilities i have put uh, 0.01 as a, a little uh, conservative way of looking at it because the size comes looking at the size part i've just put a 10 nano g over there but it can go up to less than 10 nano g as far as bias stability is concerned <coughs> No, people are not stopping at this point of time. Not just okay, sensor element is there, but what are the they are looking at other opportunities also. Now people are looking something is flying. Let us say aircraft is flying. It will look for other signals of opportunity, like from signals from mobile towers or some other radio towers, and then trying to identify its own position. Then they are trying to add to that one terrain image mapping, then pressure measurements. And then stellar navigation is there for a long time, but they are trying to combine all these things and then multi-sensor navigation along with the magnetometers, etc. They are trying to put all these things, mix up, I mean, do a data fusion, sensor fusion, and then give a better position with a very low error. This is what people are looking at. Sir, uh, I will just... Uh, Take a small, uh, if there are any questions, I'll just try to answer those at this point of time before for proceeding further. <clears throat> Hello? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. If there are any uh, questions, uh, I'd like to answer at this point of time. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> there was one question from uh, Dr. Jeet Banerjee yeah. uh, from Adamas University. His question was, uh, is the change in frequency with position mm -hmm. analogous to Doppler shift? I repeat, is the change in frequency with position uh, ah. is analogous to Doppler shift? It was uh, Dr. Jeet Banerjee's question. Uh, uh, sir, please. This question, this question, uh, can you come on voice if it is possible? If you can. Uh, let, me, let me, let me, let me give him the. Uh, uh, Michael, uh, Michael. Let me, let me, let me give him. Uh, Uh, 
uh, here only problem is the uh, participants okay. are not uh, uh, jit can you can, can you please uh, raise your hand so that i can detect you uh, the participants are not in uh, uh, alphabetical order so finding them is very okay. difficult okay sir if this question is uh, for the cold atom accelerometer part yes it is like a doppler shift I mean okay. based on the acceleration when acceleration the change in the frequency of the matter wave is only basically it's like a doppler shift okay still now the, that was the only question yeah. so you can continue sir yeah see there are some other ideas one of the Hello? ideas i like sir there is one more idea which uh, caught my eye basically so it is only a theoretical idea as of now nobody has worked on this particular idea which is called a superconducting josephson uh, josephson gyroscope okay uh the idea is uh, very simple but it's beautiful okay uh you have a simple josephson junction ring over here and it will have a current basically and in the presence of rotation what will happen is there is ch uh, change in this current flow and that flow change in the current you can use a squid basically a pickup coil and then measure that one using a squid okay and then identify what is the rotation rate because the change in the current is a function of the rotation rate and uh, as per the, the the work which i have seen this is some uh, uncommon inertial sensing concept of uh, aia uh, a 0.73 square centimeter can uh, give a rate of i mean bias drifts of the order of uh, 0.00, 0.00 okay detectable rate of 0.005 degree per hour which is very beautiful appears to be but nobody has attempted it uh, maybe it requires uh, some cryo or something because it's a superconductor nowadays uh, people are still getting up to around 77 kelvin people are making or so maybe it's in future if anyone can identify a room temperature based superconductors not in the very high pressure zone nowadays now, now recently we have seen a paper <coughs> uh we have seen a paper uh, basically which showed that room temperature superconductivity is possible but this a uh, at the extreme pressures extreme pressures uh, if, we, if anyone can come across such things uh, it's a really beautiful idea which one one can work really this is one such idea which has caught my eye uh, the other thing are the biomimicking sensors which really are going to come into picture and similarly like this there is a there is one more idea which has come is basically using a superfluid helium helium uh, basically is uh, taken to superfluidity stage that means you have to bring it down to few um, 4 degree kelvin or so then it will work like a superconductor only so similarly you have a um, maybe ring tube with a constraint in the center with a small uh, um, orifice at the center that also will generate a um, flow because of rotation some differential flow it will be creating and that differential flow you can measure and then identify measure the rotation uh, but these are some ideas which people can look at but they are difficult ideas because uh, making them as a device which can be usable uh, which can be used uh, in different platforms becomes extremely difficult because of the cryo requirements cryogenic requirements or here low temperature requirements extremely low, low temperature requirements um so what is the scope for the developing sensors is any new idea which can replace the existing sensors or technologies better signal processing to achieve higher specification miniaturization of the electronics and uh, structures packaging simplification and new materials also for sensing suppose say the existing principle itself if you want to see if that can be used uh, measured in effective way using a new material such materials also can be looked upon these are something which uh, people will be looking at across the sensing uh, sensor development. People who are working in sensors or who are going to use sensors, they'll be looking towards this type of developments coming into picture. Okay, now I'll just, uh, <clears throat> though it is not for a navigation because I'm talking about gyroscopes and other things, I'll just take uh, people to one more idea, okay, which has been used, uh, which is called a gravity probe superconducting gyroscope. This is a very beautiful idea which I liked. So I have kept some time for this one. Uh, if you allow me, I will continue. Uh, uh, no problem, sir. Uh, you yeah. have got uh, nearly uh, uh, more than 15 minutes you have got. Uh, yeah. 20 minutes you have got. So 10 minutes you can uh, keep for uh, QA and the rest 10 you can take. No problem, sir. Yeah, yeah. OK, right, right. So 
this uh, newton world says space and time are absolute and they are separate entities and when einstein has come they say no they are not separate if uh, massive rotating bodies like earth are there around that one this uh, time and uh, space are wrapped and twisted uh, the local space time gets twisted and uh, if you take the mesh whatever is there around just below the earth when earth is rotating the the, the fabric also get twisted if you care to see that is how the image is okay so what happens because of this twisting and other things this is a general theory of relativity basically uh, it goes into though it's not my topic but the uh, interest is the gyroscopes over here for me okay uh, that is called the frame dragging effect because of that one what will happen is uh, if you make a gyro move in a polar axis around the earth uh, the axis shifts because of this frame dragging effect and that shift uh, in a year is of the order of 39 milli arc seconds okay and uh, you are moving along a geodetic uh, geodetic here over here around the earth and that in itself will create a effect over here and that is around 6606 uh, milli r second per year so okay and that means if we really want to say well, yes frame dragging effect is present or not then we need to have a gyro which is better which can uh, give a rotation rate better than 39 milli r second per year so people started working for that one okay and uh, come out with a gyroscope which is called a superconducting uh, gyro only this is also superconducting gyro but this is a guinness book of world record they come out uh, i'll i'll show you maybe this one they made a sphere of fused silica and this is the a sphere which is very close to the ideal sphere that means if you make a sphere that means that there should not be any undulations on the surface there should not be any variation in the radius of curvatures or the diameters or there any it should not be there so if you expand this to the size of earth the undulations on the top surface are the order of around four to six feet or six feet approximate on an average so that type of surface they have made that type of sphere they have made on that they have coated uh, with the niobium niobium is basically a superconducting material uh, of the order of 1270 nanometer thick coating they have done and then they house this in a uh, package in something like this and it is electrostatically suspended basically there are three electrodes in one half of the package and there are three electrodes in the bottom half of the package or the other half and this ball is made to suspend and is not in touching touching any of the surface of this uh, housing basically so uh, and then they make this to rotate actually uh, this is a very beautiful concept which they have made over here there are two inlets okay for uh, helium gas to be pumped in and there there are two exhausts so one from one inlet it will go to the one exhaust and the second inlet it will go to the second exhaust and there, thereby they are creating a torque over there and this ball is made to rotate once it is set in rotation it will not stop because and then they completely remove this helium so it is completely evacuated and this uh, spherical ball keeps uh, rotating continuously it will be spinning continuously there is there is no stopping it because there is no friction at all inside there is no vac it's on, uh, in vacuum and suspended it's not touching any surface so the beauty of this one is uh, once it is set in motion it it works for its uh, completely it, it will not fail at all uh, unless unless we somebody physically gets uh, disturbs it otherwise it keeps running this system hope this video comes up just oh Uh, uh they have made four gyros over here and then this is a niobium basically uh because when it is made to spin there is an axis of the spin uh, unfortunately this video is not coming i don't know why it is not coming uh, uh, uh it would have explained the total thing actually uh, uh what will happen is uh, when this is spinning because it's a superconductor this entire thing is put in a diva and made to take to very low temperatures very low extremely low temperatures where this niobium is working as a really superconductor and the free electrons on the niobium uh, in the niobium surface they also move along the spin axis but there is a lag since the electrons are moving here it creates a magnetic field axis along uh, which is similar along the line of the spin axis parallel to the spin axis so, now we have 
now we have basically a spin axis and then a magnetic axis which are parallel to each other over here what will happen is because of this uh, frame dragging effect and uh, other effects the axis of this uh, gyroscope which is spinning axis that shifts when this shifts <coughs> there is a shift even in the magnetic axis because both of them are aligned now you put a squid uh, pickup coil over here magnetic field variation will be seen whenever this gyro is changing its axis this magnetic field axis is also changing and hence there is a change in the magnetic field sensed by the pickup coil and this pickup coil the more is the shift more is the shift in the axis more the magnetic field variation seen in the pickup coil and then they can easily measure the what is called the frame dragging effect etc and the bias stabilities of this particular gyroscope are of the order of 1 degree 1 milli arc second per year 1 milli arc second per year that's the stability which they have achieved so this is not used for navigation but it's a beautiful concept which people have come they took around 30 years to make four gyroscopes and all of them they have flown in 2002 or 2002 something around that period and the satellites have flown for around two to four years time now they are in space if the satellite is having power it may be measuring those uh, rotation measurements etc otherwise it will not be in a position to measure the rotation once it falls onto the earth it will these things also will fall onto the earth so until that time they will be in space these are the this is the best gyro ever made by humans so far it's having a bias drift and stabilities of the order of 1 milli arc second per year that's why i have to want to show i'll just try if i can show this video whether i can show this video over here or not yeah it's now coming are you able to see this one video uh, yes we can yeah t minus 20 seconds t minus 15 seconds 13 9 4 3 2 main engine start one Ignition and liftoff of the Delta rocket carrying Gravity Probe B, testing for truth and the physics of our universe. Spacecraft separation. Spacecraft separation. We've released the spacecraft. And we can confirm that on the onboard video. Yeah, here, uh, if you carefully see, they are showing whatever the figures which I have shown earlier, these two figures I have shown. Now, uh, you will see how it will be measured. It's basically if you move along a geodetic line, uh, the spin axis of the gyroscope changes. This is what it is, and this changes by around 6,000 milli arc seconds in a <coughs> per year. This is the frame dragging effect which is being shown over here. And this changes by around 39 milli arc second in a year. So now whatever the effect of the spin axis is going to change is because of both the effects put together.
the polar orbit they have chosen because the separation is maximum in this particular orbit <clears throat> and uh, they have to align the spacecraft to one long distance star so that uh, the spacecraft doesn't change its orientation that's why they could easily I mean that's the reason why they uh, I mean have a telescope over there which using which they do the direction <laughs> See, the telescope makes it possible to monitor the gyrospin axis orientation with, with respect to one guide star. And then uh, we'll see how the measurement is done also. <coughs> this is how they have made the uh, rotor quads, I mean, Q silica are the quads. In making a sensor or anything, there's a lot of engineering takes place, a lot of technology development happens. So most of you are uh, basically engineering faculty, if I'm not wrong. What you need to tell students is, or I, this is my request, because some of the students whom I have guided, they're not really in uh, interest to see the science or the technology development like this. So you may have to, maybe some of these videos would be available in the net, some latest developments, technology developments, etc. I request you all to is to bring in this idea that there's huge number of things which need to be put in by, for developing one particular device. <clears throat>
Yes. Yeah, any questions further? Uh, uh, thank you for just a minute. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Hear, hear. Very okay, okay. Uh, say, say there, are, uh, there are already two questions. Yeah. Uh, one from Lakshmi Narayan, sir, from uh, Natu. Uh, so, uh, uh, sir, can you put your question? I'm, I, I'm just uh, making you on. Uh, and another question from uh, Dr. Sharup Kumar Mitro. So, Lakshmi Narayan, sir, can you put your question? I've just enabled you in talking. Just try. Otherwise, I will put the question before, sir. And uh, also, uh, I've enabled Sharup Kumar Mitro. If any of you uh, want to talk, you just try. Uh, Lakshmi Narayan, sir. I've allowed yeah. you to talk. I see his question now. I see his question. Birds and insects are using different sensors, like yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. one eagle uses more than mm, thousand lenses in the eye. Similarly, birds are using number of magnets in mouth for sensing geomagnetic field. Is there any progress in the biomimicking sensors for navigation? Sir, yes, certainly outside people are making in India. I mean, at least we have not started. Uh, there may be a couple of people who may be working on this one, but we have not come across anyone. But we would like to work with anyone who is interested to work in that direction, biomimicking sensors, certainly, for sure. And uh, there is another question 